No one likes being at the DMV, but it's time to fill out that license renewal form. It's mostly routine, name, address, and other information. But there's one box that sticks out. It reads, do you wish to be an organ or tissue donor? You've heard about organ donation, of course, but you're not really sure what it entails, and you've got to decide whether to sign up for it right now. What actually happens when you donate your organs? Around the world, countless people are sick because one of their organs isn't functioning properly. This could be due to an injury requiring the removal of an organ, an illness that causes damage to the cells in the organ, or a genetic condition that slowly degrades the function. In past times, there was little way to save someone with a malfunctioning necessary organ, although some artificial methods like dialysis were developed. But in the 19th century, experiments began in transplanting a healthy organ from a donor to a new recipient. The earliest attempts at organ transplant were called autografts and involved skin transplanting skin from a healthy area of a person's body to a damaged area on the same person. Some reports indicate that this technique was created by the Indian surgeon Sushruta over 2,000 years ago and later continued by Italian surgeon Gasparo Tagliacossi. The science of organ donation, though, had a long way to go. Experiments in transplanting parts from one person to another may have gone back much further, but lack the understanding we have today. Roman Catholic doctrines say Saints Damian and Cosmas managed to replace the gangrenous leg of the Roman Emperor Justinian with the leg of a dead Ethiopian man. If that happened, it would have been a miracle. Even today, most amputees are still limited to state-of-the-art prosthetics, with a limb transplant still being a work in progress and very rare. Other reports say Pian Chiao, an early Chinese physician, performed a double heart transplant between two men to balance their spirits. But all these reports are apocryphal and heavily doubted by modern scientists. It would be centuries later before doctors would find the trick. Transplanting of organ or tissue to a different donor is called the allograft. It wasn't until 1837 when the first successful attempt was made on a gazelle, who'd been used for experiments on corneal transplants. Once it was successful, it would be Dr. Edward Zerm in the Czech Republic who performed the first successful transplant of a cornea on a human. The next step would be transplanting of thyroid tissue to replace an organ's function, performed in 1883 by Dr. Theodore Coker, 22 years before Zerm's breakthrough. While this was successful, tissue was working and organs weren't. Yet. That changed in 1954. Richard Herrick was a Navy man who was gravely sick with kidney failure. His brother Ronald was willing to do whatever was needed to save him, and Dr. Joseph Murray believed he could help. He performed a kidney transplant, and unlike past unsuccessful cases where recipients lived less than a month, Richard lived another eight years. Dr. Joseph Murray received the Nobel Prize, but there was one key to this surgery that wouldn't be easy to duplicate. The Herrick brothers were identical twins and had identical genetics meaning the kidney transplant was essentially an autograft. But not everyone has an identical twin to be their perfect donor. So what's the trick to making organ donation work? Preventing rejection. Our bodies are complex, and two key elements have to match for an organ to be a suitable match for a person. The first is blood type. There are four blood types, each with a different compatibility for donation. While type O blood is considered the universal donor and is the most common, type A, B, and AB are progressively more limited in who they can donate to. Then it's on to HLA typing, to make sure the proteins or antigens in the body cells won't conflict. If the antigens are different, the body can make antibodies against their new organ and reject it. And that's where the wonder of modern medicine comes in. While perfect matches on HLA type are rare, medicine is available to keep the body from creating those antibodies. These anti-rejection medications are prescribed to people after almost all transplants, and most people wind up taking the drugs as long as they have their transplanted organ, so ideally their whole life. Medical science marched on, and with the development of anti-rejection drugs, it became possible to transplant many organs that people couldn't live without. So what organs are transplanted today? Besides corneas and kidneys, which started it all, today heart, lung, and liver transplants are common. Pancreas and intestine transplants are less common but possible, and tissue transplants of skin, bone marrow, and blood are almost routine. Experiments in transplanting hands and arms have been performed, but preventing rejection is far trickier, and many have failed after a period of time. There are even experiments in transplanting a uterus so that the woman who has had a hysterectomy can carry children. The most stunning recent advancement in transplant science, though, is also the most visible. In the last 20 years, scientists have successfully managed to transplant whole faces. When dealing with patients who have been seriously disfigured from gunshots, industrial accidents, fires, or animal attacks, 
They take the facial tissue from a donor and place it on the surgically prepped facial surface of the disfigured recipient. After transplant, the face eventually shifts to the skeletal structure of the recipient, so they don't look exactly like they did before, but not like the donor either. The surgery requires vigilance with anti-rejection medication, but was successfully performed first as a partial face transplant on a woman who had lost all the skin on her lower face in a dog attack. This led to full face transplants being performed around the world. But in almost all these cases, the donors had one thing in common. They were all dead. The most common type of organ donation today is from a cadaver to a living donor, and this is what you're being asked when you sign on that dotted line. You're agreeing that should you meet an untimely end, your organs will be harvested from your body before you're buried or cremated. Those will then be given to people who need them, letting you live on beyond your body. There's no real downside, and you don't need them anymore, right? So why wouldn't everyone sign up? Well, some object because of religious rules, and others worry that the doctors wouldn't work as hard to save them in the hospital if they saw that their organs were being harvested. But there's no evidence of that, and doctors say that more people who sign up as organ donors, the better. So what happens when an organ becomes available? Organ donors whose organs can be used are usually in good health, with their organs functioning well. But anything can happen, and a piano can fall on the head of anyone at any time. If a person is dead or brain dead, and they're an organ donor, the hospital springs into action to keep the organs in good condition until that time. If someone's still clinically alive, they might be kept on life support longer than usual to keep their organs healthy. If they didn't have a directive either way on whether they're an organ donor, the doctors will often ask the grieving family if they'd be willing to sign the papers. But it's always up to the person or their family. From there, the organs will go to the next person on the organ donation list. Wait, there's a list? In the United States, the United Network for Organ Sharing oversees the transplant system for most cases, keeping a registry of everyone who's in need of an organ. When an organ comes in, they filter it by compatibility, size, and geography to give the transplant the best chance for success. Each person's place on the list is determined by their medical urgency, their waiting time, and their age, with younger recipients being higher on the list. The things that don't play a role? Income, insurance status, or celebrity status. If you wind up on the organ donation list, it doesn't matter who you are, the factors are always the same, and you can't buy your way onto a higher slot ahead of someone who needs it. And when the time comes, the organ donation team moves fast. A patient comes in and they can't be saved. They are assessed for organ health and matched to a recipient. The organs are harvested and chilled until use, but the clock is ticking. Doctors will try to find a match as close as possible, but if a high-priority recipient is far away, they'll transport that organ via courier with the highest priority. The goal is to get it to the hospital for transplant while it's still fresh and keep it from getting damaged. Although, despite what a TV show once showed, there are no reports of transplant hearts getting eaten by dogs along the way. The problem is, there are a lot more people in need of organs than there are organs available, especially for those with rarer blood types. And that's why there's another way. If you sign up to be an organ donor, the only time this will be relevant is if you're dead or almost dead. But since the first living donor transplant between the Herricks, living donor transplants have become more common, especially for rare blood types who could be waiting a long time. Approximately one in three donors of kidneys is now still living, and it's common for them to be family or close friends of the person who needs a kidney. Doctors will assess the person's physical and mental health and the health of their organs and make sure they're not under any duress. But what happens if someone doesn't have anyone they know willing to donate a kidney? The advance of the internet and social media have given new hope. People with rare blood types have put out blasts on social media asking for help to find a donor. In 2009, Chris Strouth had managed to find a kidney donor on Twitter, and when there's no direct match, a new possibility has emerged – kidney chains. This is when someone gives a kidney to someone other than their loved one in exchange for one being given by another donor to theirs. This can be as simple as a swap between two families, but for more complex cases, open-ended chains have begun. This can develop into long, elaborate chains connecting dozens of families and giving one person in each a new lease on life. So what's donating a kidney like for the donor? Donating a kidney is a serious operation, but not usually one with any complications. While some surgeries are more invasive than others, with minimally invasive laparoscopic surgery becoming more popular, it's common for a hospital stay for a donor to be between four and six days. Afterwards, it's mostly a matter of letting the incision heal, and heavy lifting and contact sports should be avoided for about six weeks. The most common risk during the surgery is serious bleeding, but it's a rare complication and doctors are good at preventing damage. After the surgery, donors can live a normal life, although they should be more careful to protect themselves from injury as they only have one kidney remaining. 
And there is one perk of donating a kidney. If you should need a kidney donation later in life, being a previous living donor bumps you up the list. But have doctors perfected the art of living donations for any other organs? Yes and no. Most of our organs, we only have one or need both, like lungs. But for liver transplants, it's possible to transplant a lobe from a living donor's liver to someone who's dying of in-stage liver disease. This was originally common for parents to give a part of their liver to save their sick child, who wouldn't need a full-sized adult liver. As this involves cutting into an organ, the risk of complications for the donor is higher than with a kidney donation, but the need for blood transfusions are still rare, and most donors recover in two to three months. Sounds like living donors are usually pretty safe, and you only need one kidney, right? Many people have asked the question, if I can save a life with a kidney and I only need one, can't I sell my kidney to someone in need? Well, that's illegal. Despite a worldwide shortage of organs available for transplantation, organ donation for profit isn't allowed in any country but Iran. While some have argued that the potential good outweighs the ethical issues, experts say that allowing the sale of organs would encourage corruption lead to the poor selling organs to survive, and give a boost to the black market where kidneys could be harvested from trafficking victims. The oversight on this is serious. While the medical costs of donors are usually paid for through insurance, any financial incentive such as a gift from the recipient family could be seen as a bribe, and it's grounds for transplants to be called off by the hospital's ethics team. As of 2020, there are over 100,000 candidates on the waiting list for organ transplants in the US alone. The wait for a heart or liver transplant can be close to half a year, while those with the highest priority rating on the heart transplant list can still wait over two months on average. So the people at UNOS are hoping everyone who qualifies checks yes on that organ donation form. They need every organ they can get. For more on the black market organ trade, check out how much is an entire human body worth, or check out this other video instead.